presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You know, at the end of the day, the question is, uh, who are we? Who are we as a species? What are we doing here? How are we going to treat these other astonishing creatures that we are fortunate enough to share this planet with? Coming up, a conversation with author Susan Casey about the beauty, mystery, and fragility of the ocean and its creatures, especially dolphins. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. For some people, living only on land is mundane. They look to the sky for solace and surprise, or like my guest today, to the sea. Susan Casey is a writer who's a lot more comfortable underwater than on solid ground. A former competitive swimmer and bike racer, Casey went on to combine her love of the outdoors with writing. She has a long history working on national magazines, including serving as creative director for Outside Magazine, editor-in-chief of Sports Illustrated Women, and editor-in-chief of O, oh, the Oprah magazine. But the tide kept calling her back, so to speak, to her first love, writing books about the ocean. Those include the New York Times bestsellers, The Wave, in pursuit of the rogues, freaks, and giants of the ocean, and The Devil's Teeth, a true story of obsession and survival among America's great white sharks. Her most recent book is Voices in the Ocean, a journey into the wild and haunting world of dolphins, which was also a bestseller. Casey does, of course, occasionally have to come up for air, and I caught up with her at the 2016 Sun Valley Writers Conference. I started by asking her about her fascination with the sea. I saw in one of your books that you call saltwater your drug of choice. True enough. <laughs> True enough. Talk about what saltwater does for you and being under it and in it. Yeah, for me, the real problems happen on land. I mean, that, that's where I can be clumsy or get into trouble. But um, when I'm in the water, I just feel like I'm at home. And that's unusual, obviously. And there's just something about the water. It has been that way as long as I can remember. But I didn't grow up near the ocean. I grew up in Toronto. So the nearest thing I had were lakes. Lakes, rivers, ocean, it's all good with me. But um, ocean in particular is... It's just the, the greatest mystery on this planet. But it is surprisingly 98% of the volume of living space of the planet. So it is where we live. 98%. Yeah, I mean, it covers 72% of the surface of the Earth. Yeah, but if you take the planet as a volume with the depth of the oceans, it is 90%, 98%, and it's also about 98% of the biomass. So when, you, when you're in it, though, you feel free? Everything. Everything. Healed, um, engaged, curious, peaceful. Um, I mean, I, almost it's narcotic. And I do a lot of open water swimming, and I am looking down, and it's just an astonishing thing. I mean, and people, I wish, I, I wish everybody would go into the ocean and see this parallel universe that's here. Uh, when I hear people talking about, isn't it cool we go to Mars, I just think, have you seen a coral reef? Have you seen the, the life that's in a square inch of a, a healthy coral reef? And it is something, I always say Dr. Seuss was a realist. He wasn't, he wasn't making this stuff up. There are creatures that, they're straight out of his books. Yeah, and there's so much we don't know, is there not, about what's in, in this 98%? Absolutely. And, but I, I do think we're heading into a time when we're getting some technology that will help us see better down there. And... Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with resource extraction and things like that. Our desire to explore the ocean is kind of mercenary, but uh, it is a new frontier. A lot of um, robotics are bringing fiber optic cables down to create pretty vivid pictures of what's going on down there. So I expect the next 10 years will be really informational in terms of just revealing it. Is that good? I mean, m maybe people will see things they want down there and then and take them or kill them? I mean, I think that's a bigger question. I, I do think it's good to know about it. Uh, 
I think it's hard for people to, when it's out of sight, out of mind, as a lot of things seem to be in the ocean, it makes it hard for people to care. Uh, I love the idea of taking them into the ocean, introducing them to things. So I think at the same time, there may be companies that are racing at, to, say, mine minerals out of deep ocean vents or something like that. There has to be an equally devoted uh, contingent of storytellers trying to weave tales of magic so that people do say, hey, wait a minute, before we rip up the seafloor, let's have a conversation about what we're doing and why, and um, let's make sure that this environment that sustains us remains as healthy as it possibly can be. Let's talk a little bit about those tales of magic. Um, despite the fact that you had been in water so much and you live um, in Maui, um, your experience with dolphins, the subject of your most recent book, was more limited. And there's this fabulous passage in the beginning of the book where you describe going out for a swim. You, had, you were trying to deal with the, the death of your dad, and you went out for a swim. And you had a magical experience with spinner dolphins. Yes, and it, it, what you said is so true because I had spent a lot of time in the ocean, tremendous amount as a swimmer and uh, reporting other books that had to do with the ocean. And I'd seen pretty much, I thought, everything in the ocean, uh, but had never had this sort of one-on-one -on -one experience with wild dolphins. They just didn't choose to come to me. I knew a lot of people that have had transcendent dolphin experiences. I hadn't had it. Uh, and I had been talking to some friends of mine who are big servers, and they said, look, you have to work on your vibe. You have, to, you have a shark. I always saw sharks. So when I finally had that, that encounter with dolphins, what was so interesting about it was it, it came at this vulnerable time in my life. So people would then ask me, well, do you think the dolphins knew that? And I have to say, I mean, I, I can never answer that definitively, but in my heart, I do think so. I do think it was an interesting time for them to make themselves known to me. And in the passage in the book, you, you, you say it was as if there was some sort of communication going on. Yes, I mean, there's obviously more communication than verbal. There's all kinds of different methods in, throughout nature to communicate information. We tend to think of it as, did we have a conversation? But it's, when I came away believing that there was some sort of uh, exchange. Um, it was a somebody. And you, you know, I've looked into the eyes of great white sharks, and you don't have quite that same feeling. This is another, this is another somebody, and we know definitively that dolphins recognize themselves in a mirror. They make that cognitive leap to saying, "This is me," and they have names. They have signature whistles that function exactly the same way our names do. So it is. It's another individual, and they allowed me that proximity at that time to be able to really get that, and it made me high. It was so exciting. And you'd been given a, a, like a little dolphin amulet as well by a complete stranger not too long before that. So everything was maybe converging to write this book about dolphins. It was funny. You know, this, you open the door. It's like literally Alice in Wonderland. When you open the door to dolphins, you are, you're going for a tumble. And um, for every bit of fascinating cutting-edge science, there's like a big mysterious question mark. And everybody, so many people as I've been out and about talking about my book, come up to me and tell me their own intriguing, cannot explain this, dolphin encounter stories. Now, when you were underwater, you described uh, the clicking, the, uh -huh. the sonar. What does that feel like to have, is, is it passing through you? Do you feel the sound waves? How, what does that feel like? You can it feel, feel it. Yeah, you do feel it, um, especially if they do it right next to you. It's like a buzzing. Uh, and it's something that they seem to do to one another as well. They seem to like the sensation of uh, buzzing one another. Um, and you hear the various clicks. The sonar makes different sounds depending on how close they are and how fine-tuned a picture they're creating. But dolphins can release 2,000 of those clicks per second and aim and adjust each click frequency and direction in individually. So it's this unheard of refinement. Um, we could never in a million years emulate this, even with our most sophisticated sonar technologies. Dolphins are also genetically quite close. Their genome is close to that of a human, is it not? Very cl surprisingly close. Um, and, it, and I, I don't know a lot of detail about where we're going to take that, but I do know that when it was sequenced, it was surprising. So if we are close in some ways, uh, you know, we typically hear about research done on primates because it seems uh, the uh, connection seems obvious. But should we be doing more research on dolphins to understand 
human disease or human healing or? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about dolphins are some very, just some tantalizing hints of abilities that they have. For example, they can, they have a, seem to have a genetic off switch for diabetes. They can maintain their own blood sugar by means of this. Um, and they also have these extraordinary wound healing capabilities that are almost like magical. They're almost like regeneration where it's, there's no scar tissue, there's no hemorrhaging, there's no infection. There doesn't appear to be a lot of pain, even from big wounds. And scientists are really interested in this because it could be that somehow in their bodies they are generating um, chemicals that, like a natural morphine perhaps, or extracting them from plants in the oceans, um, antibacterial compounds. We don't know anything about this, and it's something that you know obviously would be great to know more about. So you didn't just write this book because you're interested in the science of dolphins, right? I mean, you, you wrote this book as well because there are threats to dolphins in the world, and they're very interesting people, obsessive individuals, which I, I, guess, you like, who, who, I guess you like that type of character, who are working on these issues. I love obsession. I mean, that's as a writer, you can't get any better than somebody who's absolutely um, extreme in one way or another. And as you said, with dolphins, you find people all over the spectrum, and also information that's all over the spectrum. Um, I always think of it as sort of bright light, dark shadow. It's all extremes. But there aren't very many people that are unemotional around a dolphin or don't have some sort of intense feeling about them. And there are grave threats to dolphins. I mean, we've seen in the in movies like The Cove, um, killing that still goes on in, in Japan in that cove. There's underwater sonar, there are war games in which sonar is used. And as you mentioned, there's extraction uh, research going on, huge booms going on underneath the surface of the water. All of these are threats to dolphins. Yes, uh, there's a lot of threats. and. You know, the health of the ecosystem that they live in directly impacts us as well. It's not a sort of a, they're, we're doing great and they're not doing so well. They contend with all kinds of toxins and pollutants, really long-lived things like mercury, of course, but also flame retardants, pesticides, um, even chemicals we've outlawed like dioxins and PCBs. They all bind to, to fat. So, you know, these are animals at the top of the food chain who have blubber. They're, they're contending with this body burden that really taxes their immune systems. Um, so the health of dolphins is under stress. The noise is a constant, noise is a pressure, you know, a very high stress thing on an organism. Um, and the oceans are a very noisy place. And yes, the, the hunt in Taiji goes on. Um, the trade in wild dolphins for captivity goes on. That was really interesting to me. $150,000 a dolphin uh, can fetch and uh, to for aquariums, for shows, things like that. And it's a mafioso, I mean, it's a dark trade. Oh, certainly. And a scary trade, yeah. Yeah, certainly. So they're very social creatures. What is it like for them to be in, first of all, an aquarium? Well, I think, you know, you think of it as swimming, I think it's like being in a padded cell would be for us. Um, and, and, you know, you can have a tank that's not as nice as another tank, then okay, you're moving from a padded cell to a Motel 6 maybe, I don't know. But this is an animal that's adapted to um, swim up to 70 miles a day, to, to hunt cooperatively, to form extremely tight bonds with a particular group of dolphins, um, to communicate, to use this sonar that you know has been evolved over the course of 55 million years. And so when you take all of these natural behaviors away, this is what makes a dolphin a dolphin what you've got left is a, basically an animatronic toy in a swimming pool. Um, so it is not any kind of life for a dolphin. Uh, some species die instantly when you put them in captivity. Bo uh, bottlenose dolphins, which are the dolphins that most people are familiar with, some individuals seem to adapt to, to captivity, but they, um, all, of, all, the, excuse me, all of the dolphins show stress behaviors. They get ulcers. They have to be medicated. Sometimes they will chew on their tank lining so their teeth are ground down. That's fairly common. So then they have to be drilled out. Um, all of the orcas at SeaWorld, their teeth is drilled out so they can't be infected. They, this is a s stereotypical behavior that comes directly from stress. And it's easy for us to understand if we empathize and put ourselves in that position. Do you think that most, if not all, of the aquariums and shows with dolphins should be shut down? Uh, yes. To short answer. However, 
we have captive dolphins and we will have captive dolphins for years because we've bred them in captivity and these are animals that learn socially. You can't breed a dolphin in a swimming pool and then release them in the ocean. They haven't been taught how to be a dolphin. It would be like taking a child and who's been raised by wolves and dropping them to midtown Manhattan. So we are going to be stewards of dolphins for the foreseeable future. Um, what I like is the paradigm of the Baltimore Aquarium uh, who have an enlightened attitude towards their dolphins that they are responsible for. They realized about four years ago that the public, there's something icky about the s scripted dolphin tricks. It, it's reminiscent of circuses that, you know, it was a bear riding a bicycle and we decided we can't do that anymore. That's how the dolphin show was feeling. Um, but they have these eight dolphins. They turned it into an educational uh, experience where people can observe the dolphins. The scientists come out and give real scientific information, which, you know, you hear a lot about education in marine parks, but you have to ask yourself the intention behind it. A lot of them traffic in misinformation so that it seems less objectionable to people that the dolphins are there. Baltimore Aquarium decided to really be transparent and to base all of the actions on what's best for the dolphins, not what's best for our stock price, what's best for the dolphins. And so now they've come to the conclusion that they are going to release their dolphins into a, a semi-captive, um, you know, a, a semi-wild environment in, a, in an ocean uh, inlet of some kind. They're looking for it. They're raising money for it. And their intention is to retire their dolphins there. They'll be safe. They'll be penned off. They will be still interacting with people because that's what they know but at least they will be able to feel the ocean. They'll be able to hear noises. They'll, part of their wild dolphin soul will be engaged. We already have these kinds of facilities for captive chimps and elephants, and uh, the Baltimore Aquarium is on the front lines of creating that for captive dolphins. What about people who go, say, down to Cancun and swim with dolphins in, in a water park? What do you think of those places? Well, to quote Rick O'Berry, it costs you $100, it costs the dolphin his life. Um, there are a lot of those facilities crop, cropping up, uh, especially near a cruise ship uh, where they disembark. They're incredibly lucrative. They're incredibly uh, badly run. It's not much of a life for the dolphin, and people go there constantly. So, so how nice would any of this, uh, for advocates or activists, how would any of it end if there's just this intense desire to get near, for humans to get near dolphins? And it's a moneymaker. How, would it, well, that's how would it how would it end? I think people always ask, you know, what can we do? We vote with your wallet, you know, if nobody went to them. Now there is if people want to engage with ocean wildlife, let's go into the ocean. I mean get on a whale watching boat. That's possible all along the all of the coasts of North America. Um, there's no guarantee you'll see anything, but that's a, also an attitude that we need to get beyond that we're somehow entitled to do whatever we want to whomever we want whenever we want. Um, and if you look at kids these days, a lot of kids are really balking at this notion of uh, going to a marine park. They're, kids are aware of this. Kids understand this. Yeah. Do you think movies like The Cove, or is it, for want of a better phrase, is the tide turning uh, on these issues? I do think consciousness is, is arising, and uh, that's good news because we know why it should be the case. Um, however, in many parts of the world, there's a thriving business. Um, the Middle East is on the front lines right now of dolphin, wild dolphin export. Russia, China, Japan, all of those places have m m lots of aquariums, lots of swim with dolphins programs. Um, you know, it, consciousness is dawning, but it, not everywhere. Do you get depressed? Um, you know, at the end of the day, the question is, uh, who are we? Who are we as a species? What are we doing here? How are we going to treat these other astonishing creatures that we are fortunate enough to share this planet with? I think our survival depends on reaching some sort of a, um, a heartfelt accommodation uh, with how we treat these others. If this is who we are, then I don't think there's anything that I can do other than what I'm doing, which is spending a lot of time trying to um, convince people to be as enchanted as I am by the magic that I see in the ocean. And, you know, I do that by storytelling. There are other ways to do it. I can't change everything, but I can certainly hope to infect people with, uh, with, with the kind of love that I feel for the ocean. Your um, form of 
journalism is sometimes called immersion journalism. It's a double entendre mm -hmm. in this case because you're immersing yourself in, in the water as well. But, you know, um, with your uh, book on sharks in the Farallon Islands, you're right out there with the scientists. You're on the boat. The shark's coming up. You know, you're having a Jaws moment, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, uh, with the wave, you're barreling down on a jet ski in a 40-foot wave. And in this instance, swimming with dolphins and going to places like the Solomon Islands where there's where it's a quite a, f a f frightening uh, scenario with the, with the dolphin trade. Um, this is a fearless perhaps or facing fear. Uh, these are moments that other people would not put themselves in. Yeah, I don't think fearless. I mean, I, fear is always present. It's mm -hmm. an energy that signals us about information. So I, I think I've been in situations where I, w I did feel fear, but I did it anyway. I've also been in situations that people thought were scary, but for me were very thrilling, and particularly because of my um, comfort being in the water, uh, for example, in the wave. I think my whole swimming career enabled me to be in conditions like that without feeling tremendous amounts of terror. I mean, there was always a lot of awe, but um, most of the time it was quite exciting. And, um, and then there's just instances of complete naivete too. So um, where afterwards it's like, well, that was sort of a bad idea, but okay. Um, and when I'm in pursuit of a story or following somebody, uh, I do tend to become fairly single-minded and um, be very present. So sometimes fear, I think, is a response to projecting. Like, what might happen if you do something or what happened before and it, that didn't work out very well. But when you're actually present, there's not a whole lot of room for fear. And being around something like a feeding great white shark or a 70 or 80 foot wave or a pod of orcas or something like that, it really forces you to just be present. You're in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I wonder too if the only way that you can get a story like this is to practice this total immersion. I mean, you can't just watch or read about it. You have to be underwater. You have to be next to the shark. Um, yes? I, mean, I, I completely, I mean, for me, I don't know how to convey it any other way. Um, I really want to get every last, to just sort of drink in every last detail and try to take the reader there because I'm conscious of the fact that the reader may not ever go there themselves. So come with me. Um, and so I'll bring back everything, the smells, the textures, and I'm always trying to think about that. I really don't know how to do it any other way, which is why it takes me five years to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem that, yeah. that long when you're doing that. No, anything. certainly people have spent longer. But yeah. immersion journalism to me is a, is a wonderful technique because after a while, people really do sort of take you into their world. And then you're in there, and you're an emissary. I've, I'm a proxy for the curious reader. Um, so the deeper I can go into that world, the better a job I can do for the reader. You mentioned the toxicity of dolphins because of what's in the water now and they concentrate it in their blubber. Ironically, that's one thing that might help save them, at least from being eaten, right? They are toxic to eat, although the Japanese still market them. Yeah, I mean, all whale meat and dolphin meat to some extent is subject to this um, bioaccumulation of lipophilic chemicals like that bind to fat. Um, some of those chemicals are neurotoxins. So if you're eating whale or dolphin right now, you're really playing havoc with your brain cells. When people are looking in the grocery store for fish to eat, uh, I mean, a number of, of, of fish concentrate these toxins as well. What, what do you eat? What do you feel is safe oh. to eat? The fish thing, I don't eat fish um, unless I know there's two things I can say. First of all, the wild Alaskan salmon fishery is one of the um, is one of the better managed fisheries. So if I can get a piece of wild Alaskan salmon, as I have been able to do in this neck of the woods, it's like an unbelievable um, treat, you know. And but only when you think about how fast that happened, I don't want to eat farm fish. I think we need to find a better way to farm fish. But environmentally speaking, right now, I I don't want to eat farm fish. Um, Robin Baird, this uh, cetacean science, marine biologist that I wrote about in the book, said mahi-mahi is a fast-growing fish. It's not overfished. You know, the fact that it's fast-growing means it's not marinating in these toxins. So mahi-mahi, 
Um, and then the Monterey Bay Aquarium puts out a, uh, on its website a list of fish species that you can eat. Um, but I do think that right now, me personally, I don't want to eat a lot of fish. So you, don't, you don't eat tuna? Do no. You know. Do you think SeaWorld will eventually sh shut down because of the backlash? I think it's got to evolve, and um, there are some signs that it is evolving, albeit slowly and, you know, with, like, you know, nails dragging down the wall, kind of, but yes, it's going to have to, and I certainly wish them well doing that, support that. Um, do you so see yourself going back into the sea for the next book? I hope so, and I certainly expect to, but I have this thing about deciding when I'm going to write a book about it, I don't think I get to decide. I think the book, you know, maybe the, there's a story that you can say, hey, here's a magazine piece, but I think books find you, and I'm waiting for that. I have some ideas, but there needs to be a little bit of fate thrown in here, too. Um, so we'll see. I certainly hope so. And finally, as somebody who studies animal life, do you see a change occurring, a shift occurring with, say, animal rights, animal law? Are we on the cusp of, you know, I mean, E.O. Wilson's written about biophilia and humans' natural tendency to want to associate with other uh, non-human animals. Yeah, is biophilia some, is, is, the, is, the, is the law, I think. That is it. We are part of nature, and our integration is our health. So when we separate ourselves from nature, from everything, not just animals, but plants and the entire natural world, we harm ourselves. We are part of it. We're not in charge of it. It's not ours. It's not like some project for us to figure out how we can make the most money from it. We are part of it, and we are the stewards of it. So I, I believe that is my gospel, that uh, we cannot thrive at the expense of everything else on this planet. We must learn and evolve ourselves. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to thank talk you. about your passions with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to Susan Casey, who writes books about the ocean. Our conversation was taped at the 2016 Sun Valley Writers Conference, and I thank the organizers of that group for making time in the author's schedules for our interviews. Now, a few days after my conversation with Casey, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the U.S. Navy violated the Marine Mammal Protection Act by using low-frequency active sonar systems. It's a decision that Casey applauds. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.